Errol Spence retains his IBF World Welterweight title with a 12-round domination of Mikey Garcia. That's what this was. It was a domination. It was domination to the point where it was hard to even call it a fight. It was more like an exhibition for Errol Spence. On my card, he won every single round. I didn't give Mikey Garcia one round in the whole fight. And I believe at least some of the judges had it the same. I mean, you look at the scorecards here, 120-107, 120-108, and 120-108. That means all the judges had Errol Spence winning every round, apart from one judge who must have scored one of the rounds 10-8. Am I getting my maths correct here or am I wrong? You guys let me know in the comments. So judges had it the same as me, Spence winning everything. I think the second round was probably the closest, but even then I felt like Mikey Garcia rallied in the last minute of the round, but the first two minutes of the round were all Errol Spence. So complete domination, and he did what he was supposed to do. He was a favorite coming into this fight. Mikey Garcia was stepping up two weight divisions. Nothing less than an Errol Spence victory and a comprehensive victory would have been acceptable. So I don't think anybody is surprised or shocked by the result, but I have seen some people who were surprised by the manner in which Errol Spence went about the job. People are surprised by the fact that Errol Spence was actually boxing at long range and using his height and reach. I'm not sure why they're surprised by that. If you've seen Errol Spence when he fought Leonard Bondu, for example, he did the same thing in the Bondu fight. Because Bondu, like Mikey Garcia, is a much shorter opponent. And Errol Spence used his height and reach against Bondu for the first few rounds. Uh, forcing Bondu to try and attack Errol Spence. And Spence was going to town on Bondu. Now, he looked more impressive here than he did against Bondu. Because the level of opposition, the magnitude of the event. He was a lot more up for the Mikey Garcia fight than he was against Leonard Bondu. But, you know... Anybody who had seen the Leonard Bondu fight and some other Errol Spence Jr. fights from earlier on in his career would know that he had back foot boxing skills in his locker. You know, it's not the first time he's produced these kind of skills. And everything was on display in this fight. Long range boxing, short range boxing, jabs, uppercuts, hooks. I mean, inside, outside, body punching, you name it. It was all on display, the whole repertoire. And it is quite amazing that Mikey Garcia was able to last the distance. Now... I saw one or two people say, did Mikey Garcia freeze? Absolutely not. Uh, Mikey Garcia went in there with the very best of intentions. And to me, he actually looked the more relaxed of the two uh, when they were both walking to the ring. Mikey Garcia is a very experienced fighter. So he was never going to freeze. But what happened was he just felt Errol Spence's power early in the fight. And he felt Errol Spence's speed because Errol Spence was fast in there. And he was quick on the counter and he was using his natural advantages of height and reach. You see, Mikey Garcia has never had to deal with lots of taller opponents who can punch and are physically stronger than him. It takes a particular set of skills to be able to deal with that equation. You know, you'd have to speak to a Joe Frazier or a Mike Tyson or an experienced pressure fighter who's used to being the shorter, smaller guy. Those kind of guys hone skills over the entire course of a career which enable them to close down the distance quickly, move their head as they're coming in to evade jabs and uppercuts, and then get their own punches off. This takes a long time to develop those kind of skills. Mikey Garcia hasn't been fighting mostly taller guys, stronger guys. Bigger. He hasn't been fighting that. He's been fighting guys his kind of height for the majority of his career, or even shorter than him. So the kind of skills that he would have need needed to have to deal with an Errol Spence boxing the way Spence was boxing at long range, using his height and reach, the you know, consistent jab, the stabbing left hands to the body. A lot of people were missing the left hands to the body that Spence was throwing because, you know, some people were saying that Spence wasn't going to the body as much in the first half of the fight as he normally would. Well, that's because he was boxing at long range. You know, you're primarily going to be at close range when you're throwing body shots or at least mid range. Whereas, Errol Spence, he wasn't throwing the hooks to the body in the first half of the fight very often, but he was throwing lots of straight left hands to the body and jabs constantly. And those were also taken out of Mikey Garcia. Yeah, when someone is constantly stabbing you to the body with a left hand, that is going to take the legs away. <laughs> so it makes it even more difficult for you to close down the range and get your own punches off. 
Um, again, the left hook is one of Mikey Garcia's best punches. But as Joe Goosen in the PBC commentary pointed out, it's difficult to land a left hook against a southpaw, particularly a southpaw who's very active with their jab and they're fighting you very side on and they're tall. It's very difficult to get a left hook on in them circumstances. And as far as the right hand, everybody's saying, oh, the right hand is the one for southpaws. Bro, when you're about three, four inches shorter than your opponent and he's got way longer arms than you and he hits harder than you and he's bigger than you and he's stronger than you and he's sharp and he's moving back when you come in and he's countering you, it's far easier said than done to land a straight right hand down the pipe. <laughs> Do you understand? You're dealing with so many things that you have to take into consideration before you can land that straight right hand. So Mikey Garcia was just totally outmatched and outgunned in every department. Even on the inside, later on in the fight, when Errol Spence decided to shorten the range and try to take Mikey Garcia out, Garcia was just hanging in there. That's all he could do. And he did very well to hang in there. I have to big up Mikey Garcia, not only for his heart and his chin, somebody in my live stream i did a live stream commentary for this on my other channel on my live streaming channel um hatman boxing live and somebody said that mikey garcia borrowed golovkin's chin for this fight and it certainly looked like it because most welterweights couldn't have come through a beating like that against errol spence much less a lightweight so yeah he he borrowed golovkin's chin but he also borrowed roberto duran's defense because if any of you guys ever seen roberto duran fight uh, you will know that he was very slick on the inside when it comes to rolling with punches and half blocking shots. So when you're watching Roberto Duran, for example, against an Iran Barkley in real time, it looks as though he's getting hit a lot up close to some people. But when you see it in slow motion, you'll actually see that he's rolling and blocking shots and half blocking and slipping and riding punches. And he's not really getting hit as flush as you think he is if you're watching in real time. And the same with Mikey Garcia. A lot of the time it looked like Errol Spence was teeing off and going to town. But Mikey Garcia was actually doing a, a quite good job of subtly moving his head this way and that. Blocking shots when he could. Riding punches. I mean there were several slow motion replays where Mikey Garcia was getting hit with a left hand. But he was moving his head back at the time he got hit with it. Which obviously takes the sting off the punch. So Mikey Garcia did show, I know this is going to sound strange to some people, but he did show pretty good defense on the inside. Yeah. Uh, when they were exchanging, he was rolling with the punches and not getting caught with the full power, uh, most of the time. And he showed a lot of heart. Obviously, his brother wanted to pull him out, I think after nine or 10 rounds, but Mikey said, no, nah, I want to go the distance. And he managed to go the distance. Again, I've seen some people say, why didn't Errol Spence stop him? He tried to stop him. Errol Spence did everything in his power to stop Mikey Garcia, but Garcia was just a very, very tough little man who had just enough defense on the inside to weather the storm and come through it. The body shots were ripping into Mike, Mikey Garcia's midriff, stabbing him to the body with the straight lefts and the jabs through the first half of the fight and then ripping him to the body with the hooks in the second half of the fight and Mikey Garcia probably ain't going to be able to walk for a couple weeks after that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he'll probably be peeing red for a good long while uh, after absorbing all those body shots. That was brutal. And will Mikey Garcia be the same again? It's going to take him a long time to recover from that beating, I would imagine. So we have to see what happens to him. He's going to try to drop down in weight again. He don't need to be a welterweight. He definitely don't need to be a welterweight. He needs to be 140 tops. Uh, best for him to be a lightweight actually but again after that kind of beating is he going to be the same again is he going to have it in the tank even at a lower weight it all remains to be seen now obviously people are trashing this paper look there were people trashing this pay-per-view before the fight because they were saying it's a welterweight against a lightweight we're trashing it and that's fair enough the proof is in the pudding at the end of the day and this fight turned out to be a one-sided mismatch so people have every right to trash the pay-per-view. Um, personally, look, I, I can't knock Mikey Garcia for trying to go for history and trying to test his skills against uh, potentially the best welterweight out there, although that's undecided, all right? Certainly one of the top welterweights. I can't blame Mikey Garcia for doing that. But when it comes to Al Heyman charging wherever he charged for a pay-per-view for this fight, is that a criminal act? <laughs> Some people will say it is. 
Um, I can see what they're trying to do with Errol Spence because this was a stadium fight. They had, what, 45, 50,000 people? And it's only really Canelo that can do any kind of stadium fights in the United States. So this is kind of a, a coming out party for Errol Spence. They're trying to build him as the next pay-per-view star. And maybe they're going to be able to do it. And Spence needed this kind of thing for his first pay-per-view. Because let's say they put Errol Spence in with, I don't know, uh, uh, a Keith Thurman or a Sean Porter or one of those guys as his first pay-per-view and it was a really tough competitive fight you know I, I think that Al Heyman is probably thinking for his first pay-per-view we need something which looks good on paper but Spence is actually going to dominate and be spectacular in we want him to look like a million bucks we want the American public to buy into this man as something special we don't want to see him struggle I think that that was Al Heyman's logic behind putting this fight together as a pay-per-view because Spence is loved in his hometown, in, uh, you know, his home state of Texas. And they've got a big stadium there. He's been taking pictures with the owner of the Dallas Cowboys and all this kind of business. So you can see what Al Heyman's trying to do. He's trying to build up a following around Errol Spence. And that's why, that's why, like I say, this fight was really a showcase. It wasn't so much a fight. It was an exhibition. It was a showcase. And I f and that's clearly what it was planned to be by Al Heyman from the beginning. Now, obviously, Mikey Garcia had an opportunity to upset the apple cart and not read the script. Uh, but that's what I imagine was Al Heyman's thought process in terms of putting this fight together. So, yeah, people are going to bash it. And that's fair enough. Uh, but... Onwards and upwards for Errol Spence and Mikey Garcia. Hopefully he can recover from this and, ha and continue to have success in the lower weight divisions. Now, as far as how Errol Spence does against the Manny Pacquiao, because after the fight, Pacquiao was in the ring. He said he would love to fight Pacquiao next. He called him out. I would pick Errol Spence to beat Pacquiao, not because of this performance. I would have picked him to beat Pacquiao even, you know, two, three, four fights ago. Um, and I will pick most of the top welterweights to beat Pacquiao. I'll beat Crawford to, I'll pick Crawford to beat Pacquiao. I've, I've been saying for the past, what, two years that Crawford would beat Pacquiao. I'll take, um, Keith Furman to beat Pacquiao. Yes, even after the performance against Josecito Lopez, I still pick him to beat Pacquiao. Pacquiao is a 40 year old man. You know, Pacquiao, I don't think can hang with these young guys like that. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he'll, uh, pull out a performance, but, I think Spence beats Pacquiao. I think Furman beats Pacquiao. I think Crawford beats Pacquiao. Uh, Sean Porter, that's the one I'm not so sure about because of the fact that Pacquiao is so familiar with Sean Porter from having him as his sparring partner for so long. So he might have ways and means of dealing with Sean Porter. But then again, the reverse might be true. Porter might have ways and means of dealing with him too. But that's the only one I'm, I'm sure about. The other three... Uh, Spence, uh, Crawford, and Furman, I think they all beat Manny Pacquiao. So we'll see what happens. And as far as Spence fighting Crawford, Spence fighting Furman, and, and Porter, I would love to see those fights. I hope they can happen, particularly the Crawford fight. But given the fact that there's network differences and the beef between Al Heyman and Bob Arum, that fight unfortunately seems the least likely. We're far more likely to see Spence Pacquiao, Spence Furman, or Spence Porter. And they ain't bad fights. You know, they're all good fights. And we'll see who the top welterweight is. Um, any of you who have been following my channel for any length of time should know that I have been very, very big on Errol Spence, very high on Errol Spence for quite a long time. From long before Errol Spence fought, for the world title, I was saying that I believe in this guy and I think he is the truth. And you may remember that I upset quite a lot of British fans by picking Errol Spence to beat Kell Brook. Um, in the last year or so, I've been a little disturbed by Errol Spence being out partying, drinking, putting on a lot of weight. And I voiced my disappointment in seeing him like that. But for this particular fight here, he came in in fantastic condition. In fact, when I saw him at the weigh-in, I said to people on Facebook, I think this is the best shape I've ever seen Errol Spence Jr. in. Tremendous condition. You know, I 
I said a long time ago as well that to me, Errol Spence is kind of like a mini version of Marvin Hagler to me. He's not the switch hitter that Marvin Hagler was, but he has the same kind of mentality as a Hagler, this blue collar, um, spit and sawdust kind of mentality. And from what I saw tonight, he might have Marvin Hagler type skills because Marvin Hagler had skills. Marvin Hagler wasn't just a guy who could come forward and attack you and take you into the trenches like he did against Tommy Hearns. No, Marvin Hagler could box too. And from what I'm seeing from Errol Spence here, you know, he's still got them skills in the locker, just like we saw against Leonard Bondu. I know Leonard Bondu is not the same kind of level opponent as a Garcia, but the Bondu fight showed you that when he's ready, when he feels like he needs to, he can box long range. He can box on the back foot. He can move around. Yeah, He's not always just been this come forward slugger who's trying to take you into the trenches. That's not always been Errol Spence. He does have other dimensions to his game. Always has had. So, yeah, uh, I think Errol Spence is the truth. I think he's a tremendous fighter. And if he stays dedicated and stops, you know, the, the late nights, the drinking and all that kind of business. And that's going to be tough because now that he has had this big fight in his home uh, state, he's going to become even more of a celebrity locally and nationally. And that's going to lead to even more temptation. So now is a real test in time in Errol Spence's career because his fame is on the rise. Um, as I say, particularly in his home state, people are now in love with him. And we're going to see if he can maintain the discipline necessary to succeed at the highest level long term. So we'll see what happens. But let me know what you guys think in the comment section below about Earl Spencer's performance against Mikey Garcia. Is it what you expected? Uh, were you disappointed with Garcia's performance? Did you think he could have done more? Did you expect a different kind of fight? Uh, were you among those people who were surprised that Errol Spence had these long range boxing skills in his arsenal? Again, I don't think many people were surprised by the result. You know, if anybody had told you that Errol Spence was going to win this fight and even win by stoppage, uh, you wouldn't have said that that's a crazy prediction. Most of you, you would think, oh yeah, Spence will probably stop him. Too small. But I have seen a lot of people, as I keep banging on about, surprised by Spence's ability to box at long range. He's always had that ability. Yeah, if you've been paying attention and watching his fights while he was on the come up, you know, fighting the Bondus of the world and people like that, you would have seen he's, he's had this all along. So uh, anyway, let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. And what fight would you like to see Errol Spence in next? Would it be the Pacquiao fight? Would it be Thurman, Porter, or the the big one against Terence Crawford, I think? For me, that's my personal preference, uh, but that's the least likely, unfortunately. So yeah, let me know how you feel in the comment section below. It's happening, I'm out. Join me on Patreon. I upload a minimum of two podcasts every single week covering a wide variety of controversial topics as well as live stream Q&A sessions. Take a look on screen right now at some of the podcasts I've produced so far. For just $3 a month, the equivalent of about £2 a month, you get access to all my new podcasts and my entire back catalogue of past podcasts including my popular Confessions of a Nightclub Bouncer series. You can listen on your computer or on your smartphone or tablet by downloading the Patreon app from the Google Play Store or the App Store for free. The Patreon app also allows you to download each podcast in MP3. For less than the price of a cup of coffee, you get access to dozens of hours of exclusive content. It's easy to sign up, there's no contract, and you can cancel at any time. So come and join our community of free and critical thinkers by signing up with me here on Patreon today.